All right, good afternoon, everybody. For the last panel of our fantastic two-day conference, we're going to be talking about climate change economics. Now, climate change has obviously dominated the headlines of late. This week alone, it's been blamed for fires in Australia, an outbreak, an outbreak of plague in China, and flooding in Venice. Anecdotally, it's been reported that uh, the council was actually voting down measures to deal with climate change at the time when the chamber flooded. <laughs> that was possibly karma, I, I can't really say. Uh, we've also this week had the, uh, the Lancet has published its countdown report. This multi-institutional project, which is led by UCL, considers progress on climate change and health around the world. And in particular, it noted that small island developing states have played a key role in drawing attention to health and climate change issues. I'm not going to say very much more because we've got a fantastic panel here today to tell you about the climate change dispute options and about how one can hopefully run a climate change dispute as economically as possible by using some modern technology and excellent methods of damages calculation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn you over, first of all, to Stephen Finizio, who I'm sure needs no introduction. Thank you, and good afternoon. What I'm going to do is, hopefully with the PowerPoint, what I'm going to do is try to set the scene a little bit. And I'm going to talk about options that states have for dispute resolution mechanisms when dealing with environmental and climate change issues. And frankly, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, could, you could substitute in human rights for climate change and, and environmental disputes into, the, into what I'm saying. But I'm going to focus a little bit on, on some specific climate change related aspects. I start with the caveat that I, I keep staring at the title, the problem of choice, and wondering whether it's the absolutely wrong title or the absolutely correct title. And I say that because as I'm going to do, one of the, one of the issues I want to focus on is the fact that there is often no choice. And, and I think when we talk about climate change in small states, sometimes we get overly eager to think that there are more options out there. So what I want to quickly do is talk about limitations in some ways with regard to dispute resolution mechanisms. So we can also think about opportunities with, within the in existing options, but also opportunities to create new options. Because there are, as you think about the limitations, it becomes, I think, pretty immediately apparent that there is room for new ways to approach this, uh, these issues. And we heard one this morning, actually, from Justice Kandikasi, which I, I, I told him already I'm going to try to integrate into this a little bit. But, but the, the idea, in part, is to be thinking about how do, when we look at the limitations, how do we fix that by thinking about ways we might be able to move forward with, with new options? So really quickly, and I'm going to go quickly in part because you want to hear more from other people than me, what are, what are the options? Well, the options generally are domestic regulation and litigation or prosecution within the, within the territory and the territorial reach of a, of a state. Um, and that's where most environmental and climate change disputes take place, particularly when the state is is a claimant. And, and let me make another caveat. What I want to get to ultimately is a discussion of claims by states against private actors. But we have to look at the world of the options here, because many of the options that we have now are state state, or are or, or options where states are respondents or defendants and not, and not bringing claims. And that's ultimately where I want to get us to, is thinking about what options are there for states to bring claims, and particularly small states to bring claims. So the, the, the place we mostly see uh, disputes related to climate change coming from the state as the claimant or the plaintiff is in the domestic courts or the domestic system of, of that state. We also have, I'm oh, sorry, we also have treaty-based claims between states. And I'll quickly talk about that and some of the limitations there. Um, we have claims against states pursuant to regional human rights regimes, again, claims against states. We have disputes between companies and states under investment treaties. And then we have the possibility of consensual use of international arbitration between companies and states. And finally, mixed into all this, we have possibilities to use ADR mechanisms like mediation and conciliation. And it, we'll talk a little bit about how that fits in. But the overarching message is that any means of resolving climate change disputes will raise issues of jurisdiction and consent. It will raise issues of just justiciability and arbitrability, and it will also they will it will also whatever means you're thinking about will raise issues about what remedies, what relief is actually available through the mechanism you're using. And then, and when we think about options, we have to keep all those things 
in mind. So really quickly, uh, treaty-based uh, claims between states. Um, one of the problems I think we all have is we can't see the screen. Uh, so there are, there are a number of ways that, that states can use treaties to bring some form of litigation or um, decision-making adjudication process with the tribunal between states. And the most well-known are the International Court of Justice through the optional clause, uh, through, op through bilateral uh, treaties or through multilateral treaties, and there's some examples on there. And with the optional clause reference, one of the things we, we've noted on the slide is that some of the biggest, if you want to call them this, emitting emit states have agreed to jurisdiction before the ICJ under the optional uh, under the optional clause. So that is an opportunity for state-state claims. There are also claims potentially through things like the International Tribunal for the Law of the Seas. We've talked about that off and on over the past uh, two days. And there are also opportunities, again, through regional courts like the European Court of Justice, where, where, where states can bring claims potentially against other states. Um, what, are the, what do we see as issues when we're looking at treaty-based claims? Well, there are scope, there are scope issues. What, are the, what, what sort of issues can be brought? And there are other limitations. And the primary one is this issue of consent. Um, and while you have the optional clause for the ICJ, both states will have to agree to accept the jurisdiction of the ICJ. Uh, we do have options then. If a tr particular treaty does allow it, there may be options for different ways, different dispute resolution mechanisms um, that you can choose, whether it's litigation in, in an international court or whether it's arbitration. So some, some treaties do provide choices if there is that initial consent between the two states. Um, and you, we, we know, and those of us who focus on climate change issues, there are, there are dispute resolution mechanism, mechanisms in some, some of the uh, treaties dealing with climate change issues. And I put those on the slides. And, and in most of those treaties will allow the, the state to have a choice between litigation at the ICJ or, or uh, arbitration. So this, this is state state, the state state mechanism. Um, I'm going to shift quickly to this issue because, again, this is focusing too much on states as respondents, but I'm going to quickly note that we do have the option when we're dealing with climate change issues. And if you get creative, you might think of some, there might be opportunities here to do things more creatively, but um, some regional human rights charters do provide uh, for the basis to bring climate change claims against states. And, the, and, and then a mechanism by which those claims can be brought on the screen. There's the example of the European Convention on Human Rights, which allows you to bring claims then through the European Court of Human Rights. Also, the uh, the American Convention, which allows claims to be brought through the Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights. And there's been, as some of you will know, um, interesting, some interesting jurisprudence coming out of the Inter-American Court recently in which um, there was an advisory opinion saying that there's a human right to a healthy environment. And on the slide, I, I, I won't take the time on this, but you, there are some theories as to which, which claimants might be able to bring claims against states, at least, and again, this is against states, that are based on, on that notion of, of the right to a healthy environment environment. So again, moving fast to cover the landscape. Um, disputes under investment treaties. And the, and the last panel in particular kept referring to investment treaties. And I think it's worth slowing down a little bit and talking <coughs> about what is happening under in investment treaties, bilateral or multilateral. Investment treaties designed to protect primarily investors when they bring, uh, when they make an investment in, in a state that's subject to the, the treaty. So what we start with the general understanding that bilateral investment treaties, cre treaties create a mechanism by which an investor can bring a claim against a state. And that was some of the assumptions of the previous tribunal. Um, as we talk about treaties, and I want to come back to this question about scope of states to use investment treaties potentially to raise climate change or environmental issues. But there are there is a development in this area where we're seeing increasingly um, language being put into at least model BITs that refer to some set of obligations with regard to the environment or similar types of concerns and other human rights issues. So, uh, for example, in the, the, new Dutch, the new Dutch model bit, there's a reference to the idea that the contracting parties ref, uh, reaffirm their obligations uh, in the field of environmental protection, labor standards, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, so that starts to create the notion that a, a, a bit may give an opportunity for there to be environmental protections or environmental rights. Those really have not been litigated yet. And if you're paying any attention at all to that language, it says the contracting parties. That means the two states have, are reaffirming their, their commitment, which doesn't mean the investor comes under any obligation. But 
it starts to create the thought that maybe we can go further, potentially, or that there might be scope even in these, the, with this sort of language to say that there are some obligations that the investor has, including pretend, potentially defenses about admissibility if an investor doesn't comply with, with obligations relating to the environment. So um, while we talk about this as a one-way a one way thing where investors are bringing claims against states. There is scope under some treaties for the state to raise environmental claims or envi environmental issues, certainly always as a defense. So we start with the idea that states can bring environmental issues into cases against companies that have brought claims against the state by saying you've you've vi violated obligations relating to the environment. And we've seen we've seen examples, and there's an example on the slide where El Salvador in the Pacific Rim case um, brought, defended a, a claim on the basis that the, the investor had violated environmental norms. Um, we're, then we need to stop and, and, and talk more expansively. And again, I think the last panel was a little bit negative about the idea that it's clear that or there's very limited opportunities for states to actually bring affirmative claims. But there are increasingly uh, opportunities, or that's the wrong word, examples of states bringing counterclaims in treaty cases against the investor for environmental breaches and otherwise. Now, the question of whether or not the state has the right to bring a counterclaim is usually one considered one of intent. And, and it depends. Um, the way the current jurisprudence looks is it looks at the language of the treaty to see whether the treaty potentially allows the state to bring counterclaims or whether the treaty is written to only allow the, the investor the right to bring claims. But we've had two recent, two recent examples, um, both claims against Ecuador, where, where Ecuador has brought counterclaims. And in the Burlington case, received a $41 million award on its counterclaims. And in the Perenco case, liability has been found on the counterclaims. And I think we're waiting still for the, for the, for the quantum uh, phase of that case to be finished. So we shouldn't ignore the fact that if the right opportunity arises, because the investor has to initiate the claim. And so one, one place when we talk about opportunities is there are some notions out there that maybe we can start to rewrite treaties or create new forms of treaties where the, where the obligations will, will flow both ways and the opportunities will flow both ways, where, you, where a state might, in the first instance, be able to bring a claim rather than only doing it through a counterclaim mechanism if that's available. So uh, consent to international arbitration, shifting away from treaties. Uh, you have generally there might be arbitra arbitrability issues, but generally the, uh, some form of international arbitration, and we're not talking about treaty-based arbitration anymore, but consensual arbitration agreed between a state and a, a, a private uh, entity can be uh, arbitrated through uh, international arbitration. Now, there are always going to be significant consent and privity issues. You need, if you're going to use international arbitration, you need some consensual basis that ties the particular parties to the dispute to an agreement to arbitrate. And this is where I'm trying to think through Justice Kandikasi's proposal, because we have to figure out how a, a, a regional court will necessarily be able to get a, a binding arbitration award that will fall within the New York Convention. Now, I think it can be done, but we have to think about how to do it, because consent is going to be critical. Um, but parties always can con contractually agree to resolve disputes about uh, environmental or climate change issues through arbitration if, they, if there's that sort of consent. And where, that, where might that consent come from? Well, we're seeing initiatives by some businesses to include commitments in their contracts with states to environmental uh, protections or environmental obligations. So a, par, a, a company can say, we're going to put in our contract um, that we will commit to certain environmental um, obligations. States can insist in their contracts with companies that the company commits to um, certain environmental obligations. So that creates then, and then you can decide if you want to, 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 to use arbitration rather than local courts. Um, and, and Justice Kennecasi gave some of the reasons this morning as to why arbitration might be more effective and attractive than even for a state to use its own courts. Um, we also have the example of in an industry-wide agreement like the Bangladesh Accords, which was in the uh, was labor related, but you, you could imagine the possibility of creating uh, a binding commitment through some sort of industry wide agreement that would create a forum for arbitrating environmental disputes. Um, and um, we also are seeing in the background of this, you want me to stop? Uh, we're seeing in the background of this some efforts to, to create some rules around using ar arbitration to deal with climate change issues, and those are on the slide. Um, we always, though, have to be careful if we're going to use 
if we're going to use international arbitration, we have to be careful because we need to make sure that what you end up with is an enforceable award. And there are potential issues in some contexts where, with whether or not an award about the environment might be considered non-commercial and therefore, therefore fall outside of the scope of the New York Convention. So therefore, the enforceability benefit you often get from an international arbitration award might, might not be there depending on the, na the exact nature of the sort of dispute we're talking about. So if, you're th if we're going in this direction, we have to be aware of limitations in existing conventions like the New York Convention to uh, commercial issues and whether the issues being raised would be considered con commercial. I am not <laughs> going to spend any time now. Maybe we'll come back to it later on mediation, but mediation has some real benefits. It may sound empty. Why would we mediate? And how would a state ever get a, a polluter to mediate? But we can come back to talk to you. It's always available in many of the international treaties and other uh, mechanisms. We've talked about mediation is always a, uh, a consensual option, but also often a, an obligation that can be uh, used under that treaty. But we'll come back and talk about that later. We're gonna, well, I'll stop there at this point and, and hopefully have set the scene a little bit to when we're talking about what are the choices. Maybe they're not choices entirely, but what are the options um, and what are their, their limitations, but where are there also opportunities for small states in particular to use, uh, to, to use mechanisms to, to bring claims, not just to defend claims. Thank you very much, Steve, for that. Um, that wonderful overview. We're going to um, we're going to change gears very slightly now, and we're going to talk about blockchain. So we're going to hear first from Matthias Goldman, who is VP Finance and co-founder of Constellation, based in San Francisco. All right. How about the slides? Ah, oh, do you change the order? Slides. Oh yeah. no! Fantastic. All right. All right. Hello, everybody. Well, uh, <laughs> technology is not let us down. Fantastic. All right. I'll try to make it as uh, quick as possible since we're in a little bit of a time crunch here. Katarina's got to go for her flight. So apologies for breathing through a topic that is very comprehensive, and you might have heard of that topic. Uh, at least in the news about uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so there, there's a whole uh, plethora of implications that will be coming upon us from a legal perspective, from a governance perspe perspective, from finance side. And uh, I'm working in that industry for the last three years. I've been in, in, that, in that space from literally day one. And I'm going to present to the collective unconscious, as Young might say, a little stone of awareness uh, that might be spreading in maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but in the years to come. And that might affect uh, also your work as, as lawyers, as arbitrators, as persons who are working in litigation cases. And in order to do that, I have to give you at least a little bit of a brief overview of what blockchain actually is and what are the main qualities of a blockchain. A blockchain is an encrypted global decentralized database it creates immutable entries that are linked to each other, uh, and it thereby creates an audit trail that is not uh, hackable or spoofable. So a lot of you might find these criteria already by itself quite attractive, and that in itself has a, a lot of different use cases that people are working on. And I just came from Malaga from a European Commission-driven work group where I participate in a couple of working sessions where the European Union tries to grasp what is actually happening in that space, how can we regulate, how can we work with that and actually embrace the potential uh, that that technology brings. And there, <laughs> in, in connection with that, that's what some people uh, refer as to the red pill moment, because blockchain is not just a technology, and that's one of the reasons why I'm actually standing here. Um, it, has, it has a whole range of implications, and people liken it to the red pill that Morpheus offers to Neo in the movie The Matrix, because there are so many ripple effects and implications and uh, that this technology uh, can be applied to. Um, so just briefly, we're at the 11th anniversary of uh, blockchain <coughs> decentralized networks. Bitcoin was the first. It had its anniversary uh, at the 31st of October this year. Um, and with each of these iterations of that technology, we see a different value proposition and different implications. And Bitcoin was um, started as uh, with the claims to be the next financial uh, global cur currency. And, and we all know that's not going to happen. Um, 
the story diverted to Bitcoin as a store of value. The next generation blockchain, uh, which is Ethereum, um, started with a different value proposition, which we call smart contracts, which are self-governing, self-executing contracts, program programmable contracts that self-execute, which uh, um, delete the need for an intermediary in the ideal techie sense of speaking about it. Now, my company, we are working uh, at a third generation blockchain, which is signified by high throughput, which makes it ideal for big data processing, sensor networks and IoT networks that process a lot of data and securing those pipelines. So that has uh, implications I'm gonna uh, portray a little bit. So a classical blockchain is on the left-hand side. Uh, it's blocks that are being encrypted, transactions are being encrypted in these blocks and they are tied to each other by cryptographic hash functions. So the reason why it's not hackable or spoofable is because if you take a block out of, out of that chain, the cryptographic key signatures don't fit anymore and you would need to basically hack the entire global network or at least 51% of that network in order to change a single transaction. Now the third generation we're working on is called the DAG chain. It's a directed acyclical graph and it can process much more transactions because it processes the transactions simultaneously, lending it therefore to a wider range of applications. Um, how does it connect to climate justice, <coughs> climate change? And from my perspective, I'm by no means a lawyer. You should have uh, realized that by now. But from, <laughs> from my perspective, um, what am I seeing as a, as a technologist, as an entrepreneur? And when I look into the news and, and look at the, the, the media landscape, what I've noticed is that there is a, a trend, or at least there has been a case in New Zealand where a river has been granted a legal status as a person. Um, we also see... Apologies. We also see cases um, of uh, people suing governments, like the G Dutch government has been sued for not taking enough action uh, in terms of climate change. That case has actually been won. There has been cases against big oil in the United States. And um, another case uh, by a Peruvian farmer who lives in the Andes uh, against one of the largest European energy or power companies called RWE. And I want to go a little bit into that case and Please cut me off if I'm <laughs> if I'm if I'm going too long. But so that farmer lives high up in the Andes. They have a mountain lake um, over which uh, a glacier is looming, and due to climate change, that glacier is melting. And now scientists have calculated that if those ice sheets of that vertical uh, cliff of the mountain breaks off, there, there will be um, kind of like a small tsunami, and it's it will be flooding the village of that Peruvian farmer. Now. The farmer took action in combination with German Watch. He sued RWE in a German court, and after um, the, the claim has, or the, the, the lawsuit has been admitted, so it's now in a fact-finding period. And that brings me to blockchain and the things we are developing right now. So that's fresh off the press. It's a, it's a new idea, and remember, you heard it here first. <laughs> so, so, um, so now imagine. Um, if you have a sensor network, and because legal cases draw upon data, right? So if, for example, if that ice sheet falls into the mountain, usually I imagine you would send a team that assesses the data, that takes photographs, that, that um, assesses the status, the, the, the truth that that ice sheet fell into the lake, and then a, 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 a chain of arbitration or legal action ensues upon that data that's being generated, right? So what if we have a sensor network at that lake that is immutable, that is taking different data sets, for example, water height data, temperature data, vibration data, and builds a consensus between all these different data types. And due to the blockchain nature of things, you can be sure that the data that's being created is actually true. So in a sense, a blockchain model that, that we would be using through a consensus mechanism, through all these different data sets, is able to generate a true statement. 
And we have uh, pushes in the German uh, administration that blockchain driven data uh, gets a legal status in the sense that it can be used in court. Um, spinning that a little bit further, you could imagine a, a sensor network that generates data that represents the truth. Now, what data needs to be measured? I think Katarina is going to uh, talk a little bit about that, but that would require interdisciplinary teams that have a very well-versed understanding of the legal environments and what data would be considered as factual and truthful. You can program that into such a network, and once the ice sheet falls into the lake, you have an immediate output in your in your dashboard, basically, and that's just an example, uh, <laughs> spitting out the, the current state of a natural feature, in this case, the ice sheet and the lake. Now, you can project such a such a mechanics into the future. Uh, you could attach sensor networks to forests, to water bodies, rivers, and and so on. So there's a there's there's a whole um, um, idea how to actually uh, represent a natural feature in a technological data-driven sense, but then that ties into a legal sense as well uh, through the uh, litigation or arbitration that might ensue if something happens with that feature. Um, so, so if you spin that a couple of years into the future, and if such a network was to, de de to be deployed successfully, that might lead us in the long term from a solely arbitration-based legal approach that takes in the forefront a lot of time of assessing the veracity of data uh, to a more programmatic approach where you have real-time insights into a natural feature at any given point of time, and that would probably, in my imagination, force an approach that is more programmatic and even more preemptive. And uh, I leave you with that little spark of inspiration, and there's a lot of mo more work to be done, and I'll hand over to Katharina. Thank you very much. I think you persuaded us all to take the red pill in due course. But for now, let's, let's hear from Dr. Katarina Adam, who's a professor at the University of Applied Sciences in Berlin, and will be continuing the consideration of blockchain as the savior to expensive evidence gathering. We will see. First of all, thank you so much for having me here. And I would like to say thank you to the organizer, and as well, thank you to Petra for giving me the opportunity to share my ideas, to share my thoughts with you. And let's start with blockchain, savior to expensive evidence gathering. Wow, incredible. Isn't it a tool you would like to go for? Yes, instantly, right? But let's see whether <laughs> blockchain really can solve that issue. And you know, I think this is something I would like to, to make to create that awareness of we have to be sure whether blockchain is really a need for you or not. And for this, and that's, I would like to say, the whole speech, what I would like to tell you is about find your process and check out whether it really makes sense to implement this kind of technology in your processes. And there are a lot of senses, or, or cases, sorry, cases where it really makes no sense to implement blockchain. And therefore, let's go, let's see. And we can see that we've come a long way. We have seen a lot of things. When you once started with blockchain, it was like, it was for the geeks, it was for the nerds, you know? You need to coding and sit in front of your laptop and do things like that. And you also now figure out that you need much more than being good in math and having an idea of what is encryption about. So you see, we want to include all the stakeholders. We want to go for security and trustworthiness. It sounds great, and it sounds like we can do this from a technical perspective. But I've, what I've learned during this session here, during the conference here, we have to learn so many things. There are things we, from the technical side, can solve probably sooner or later. But what we do not know is what kind of processes are behind. And this is where I do believe we have to exchange our ideas, our approaches, and find out how we can bring this together. Blockchain itself, as we, as we have heard, it's a database. And you know, a lot of people which are so eager to tell you the truth about blockchain, think about it. It's a simple database. Probably not that simple, but the features, there are some specific features which makes it not so simple. But first of all, it is a database. There are some things we could Highlight like immutability, security, and no single point of failure. Technical stuff which I do not have enough time for today to explain. But one thing I would like to show you, which is because of 
uh, immutability. And you see Grumpy Cat, and this is what one of my students has done for me, Grumpy Cat. We made a picture out of from Grumpy Cat, we put this on a so-called security hash algorithm. As you can see, that picture created that hash. I have a, do I have a pointer here? Some, they, that's the start with 1A3 and so on. And probably this could inspire you. What we have done with that picture, we made a single change, a small, tiny little change of we just changed one pixel in that picture, one single picture. And what you can see, the hash is not longer the same like it was before. So there's a difference in. You see, when you, when you cheat somehow, or you would like to cheat, something which is stored on a blockchain, you can instantly see that someone has changed something. And that could be probably interesting for you. I don't know that because I'm not a lawyer. I do not know all your processes. But I for sure know that you probably like to have something you can rely on. And we heard about crowdfunding in the previous session and probably also crowdfunding and collecting the money and using blockchain technology could be something which seems to be a very nice idea for getting money for small states for litigation issues. We don't know. We have to check it. Yeah, and then we also talk, when we talk about blockchain, it's a so-called trust engine. Oh God, what should blockchain all should do? And the question is, how do we trust? Honestly, I don't believe that a technology can fix any trust or we, we, we do not trust someone. Trust is based on human relationship and not any technology will overcome that. But what we can do with that kind of technology, we can... Um, you know, processes, daily routine work, which you spend tons of times on that. You can use a technology and make it trustful that, that what you get out of this is you can rely on. You can trust that that data is correct. And therefore, a technology can make sense. And then you can use that time for, you know, generating more trust in between the negotiation between parties using that time for, I would like to say, things which are more worthful. Here's one example, just, you know, what I'd like to, to discuss with you is that we need to understand, we have to check the processes. And it should be an example of aviation and um, what is this about. And probably you can see there are also laws and regulations. The only thing which I, you know, I will skip it and it's not that important. I just want to show you, you need to understand what kind of processes are there? What kind of sub-processes are there? Where you really find a process which is worth to put on a blockchain? Again, not all processes are good enough for being secured, being backed up by a blockchain solution. The existing solution you already use probably is better than that what we're going to do with a blockchain solution. We make it much more complicated. So therefore, carefully, be careful, scrutinize what you are doing, what you are talking about. But if you find something, it really makes sense. It's a huge, yeah, I would like to say it's, it's like a, it's, a, it's the magic in your hand. And probably you can, can use that. Some other thing, we're talking about technology and Matthias and I, we are really, we, are, we, are, we stick to technology things and we like that very much and we are fond of it. And what we also need to consider, we are talking to human beings. How do they understand us? How do you understand us? When we start to, you know, talking in details about what is a, a block size, how many transactions we can serve per second and so on, you will look at us and say, what the hell are they talking about? And that's it. We need to understand how human beings are behaving. And that's what we need to put into account while talking about new solutions while implementing blockchain. And here we can think about risk taker or profit optimizer. You probably know that when do you become a risk taker? When you have the chance, the likelihood is high that you get a profit out of this. You will be a risk taker. You will be very risk averse when the likelihood is very high that you will lose. And you know, into when you go into negotiations with your, you know, as a, sm a small state uh, country, <laughs> what kind of situation are you facing? You probably want to secure your stack 
or you want to go beyond. And this is also something you have to take into account while talking about technical solutions, which you probably would like to implement. So something to think about. Yeah, aviation industry, please allow me to skip because of that was just to the former example. And I once thought I have quite a little bit more time, but sorry for that. Let me conclude. You probably all know the term, know your customer. I would like to coin, know your process. If you have no idea about your process, it makes no sense to use blockchain. Because probably you would use just blockchain for the sake of, oh yeah, I got news, I, I, I've used that. Break down the process into the sub into sub-processes, find it out. And probably there are tiny little processes which are really good to be backed up by a blockchain solution. You need to find the relevant data. You need to find um, and you need to understand that transparency could be a very good, uh, useful thing for you to, to bring things to the world. You need to work in interdisciplinary team and you also have to take into account the uh, human being or our behavior. And for this, please allow me to close with the following things. Probably some of you guys know that. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the small state conference. It's continuing mission to explore strange new world, to seek out new life and new civilization, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Probably you would like to join me. I would like to join you. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we managed to get her, hopefully, home on her flight as well. The magic is in everybody's hands, as we now know. And we even got a Star Trek reference in there, yes. which is fantastic. So that brings us now, then, to Simon Phillips. You can, if you would prefer to speak from there, you can speak from there. Simon is a barrister practicing international law at 20 Essex Chambers, London and Singapore. And he is going to be talking about interstate human rights claims and cultivating a grunt norm, which I suspect I have mispronounced, and so I apologize to any German speakers out there. Yes, luckily, we've only got one left to correct us. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then I apologize to him. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mandy, um, and thanks everyone for staying to the end of this um, extraordinary conference. I feel very lucky to speak and have uh, Stephen's uh, panorama and Matthias's and Katarina's uh, creative thoughts to, as um, going before. So in a way, I might be able to pick up some some threads from them too. I was um, I was invited to speak about two topics, but I'm really going to squeeze the first one down because it's more of a footnote to Stephen's presentation. Uh, as Mandy mentioned, I'm, I'm basically a litigator, and my interest here is in public interest environmental litigation, especially strategic uh, litigation on human rights issues around climate change. Currently, I'm a member of a council team which is uh, bringing a case on behalf of some uh, indigenous people in the Torres Strait Islands in Australia, which is what you're looking at up there, against the Australian state. Uh, contending that uh, Australia is in violation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights by reason of its absolutely woeful policies on climate change mitigation and uh, adaptation. But I want to stress, I don't believe in litigation for its own sake, and I don't believe that litigation lawyers deserve a starring role in any kind of successful strategic litigation. In fact, the lawyers are working behind the scenes and the lawsuit is only one part and not the biggest part of a wider political, social, media uh, campaign of norm entrepreneurship. And it's a great honor to play a part in that. But I think we disputes lawyers should never kid ourselves that we are the leading actors uh, in those events. Um, Right. Now, what I was going to say about uh, about interstate human rights claims is that they're a bit of a, a Cinderella option among disputes, but they are possible. It's a good week to say that because this is the week that the Gambia uh, took the Republic of the Union of Myanmar to the ICJ over genocide, which is an inspiring thought and may lead others to think similar thoughts. Who knows? Um, also, the United Nations treaty bodies are across 
the issue of the human rights impacts of climate change. These are statistics uh, collated by the Center for International Environmental Law in Washington, D.C., but they show the increase over time in the mention of climate change in the concluding observations of the, of the human rights treaty bodies when they're considering states' reports. So you can see that these international human rights experts are totally now across the issues of climate change and are regularly pulling up states and saying, what are you doing about this? And of course, states are now pushing back uh, against that, which is a, a, a serious concern for us all. Uh, Interstate human rights cases do not happen a great deal, but there are examples of them in the past. And of course, we heard very interesting remarks on them this morning from uh, Dr. Maynard. They've happened in the European system. They've happened in the inter-American system. It is possible under the African Convention on Human and People's Rights, but it hasn't actually happened yet to the best of my knowledge. And we've also recently seen some interesting examples of advisory opinions being used as a sort of quasi form of interstate litigation. Uh, recently, of course, the, the ICJ's advisory opinion on the Chagos Islands case, but also the advisory opinion which uh, Stephen mentioned in his talk was in many ways an interstate case raised by uh, Colombia, which was very dissatisfied by uh, Nicaragua's coastal mega projects, infrastructure plans, which threatened to devastate the environment of the wider Caribbean region. And Colombia, having uh, stormed out of the ICJ in 2012 after losing uh, a case in the ICJ, had no, no resort to the ICJ. So they cast around for other options for international judicial settlement. And the best that they found was to bring this case before the uh, Inter-American Court which took the opportunity then to give an extremely broad judgment about the right to a healthy environment in international law. Now, uh, the second part of my talk is about something completely different, which is to say that in addition to creating the fund that we're all going to contribute to after this for small states, <laughs> uh, and in addition to finding out what blockchain is and, and what it can do for us, there's one more thing we have to do, and that is to redesign the entirety of international environmental law. Uh, let's face it, we've had this thing called international environmental law for nearly 50 years, since the Stockholm Declaration of 1972, and its record to date is absolutely lamentable. Uh, maybe Dr. Jean-Pierre Gauchy and I could have a bit of an arm wrestle about whether global migration law is more unsuccessful than international environmental law or vice versa, but it's a body, at any rate, my body of law that is in a total mess and I defy anyone to, 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 to consider a worse one. It is not in any way uh, joined up or effective. It consists of multiple very fragmented regimes uh, a profusion of different institutions which do not cohere around a single goal or agenda and which often have great difficulties talking to each other even. Uh, that has been ameliorated to some small extent by initiatives to co-locate secretariats and to get them talking and so on, but, but those are baby steps and it has been very contentious. I'm very interested, for example, in some research by Margaret Young who followed the story of uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization trying to work together with CITES on the issue of which organization had competence to regulate uh, the taking of endangered marine species at sea. And it took them 10 years to, to agree on a memorandum of understanding that had almost nothing in it. So <laughs> very difficult really to, to work together. And all of that incoherence means there's a great, re great risk and a great reality actually of problems not being solved at all, but problems just being moved around. Remember more than a decade ago when the EU had this brilliant idea that the well, solution to climate change was going to be biofuels. By burning biofuels, crops, ethanol, it does generate less CO2 than burning coal. But of course, in order to get those biofuels, you have to then clear what was pre-existing land, forests or whatever, in order to turn it into biofuel agriculture. So just the land clearance created between, somewhere between 200 and 1,000 years worth to, of, of emissions to make up from the savings of, uh, of the biofuel, not to mention all the other problems uh, like biodiversity <laughs> loss and all the nitrates from the new agricultural lands going into the sea and causing marine dead zones and so on. So a complete disaster. Another aspect of the disaster is that 
the thinking, as it seems to me, in so much of international environmental diplomacy has been stuck in the 1970s and 1980s with the logic of that there is a trade-off between the environment and development, which of course is true at the micro level. If it's a question of, do we turn this forest into a cineplex? Clearly there is a trade-off between GDP and environment on that micro level. But, um, is, and, and that you frame then the whole issue as being how much, uh, how much can we afford to protect the environment given our, our economic um, needs and priorities and development. But of course that misses something, which is all those micro trade-offs add up to a macro process, which is the, just the erosion of the biophysical base on which modern civilization rests. And once you have eroded that, we start to get into very, very serious difficulties indeed. So for example, the insect populations, as you probably know, are in free fall. We have got rid of half of the world's insects in about 40 years, and they're still in free fall. So <laughs> things are really bad, basically, and that's not a problem that you can approach with a trade-off mentality. It has to be a fundamental realignment. What do we have to do in order to have a world where the insect population can continue to exist and recover? We're gonna need them for our agriculture, if nothing else. So, it seems to me I've only got one slide on all of this, but um, <laughs> there we go. It's a very so, comprehensive slide. So the thesis I, that I suggest to you is that the current body of international environmental law is is, is out of date and it was only a start. And we shouldn't take it as this wonderful sort of inheritance that we now have to treasure and protect and continue. We have to treat it as just the first experiment in doing something and it didn't go that well and it's now time for a big rethink. And therefore there co comes the question, well, what should be the orienting principle of a rethink of international environmental law? Many different ideas have been put forward. Um, I will suggest that perhaps the most fertile one is the concept of planetary boundaries, which has been much discussed in scientific and policy literature recently. Um, whether we can now say there is a grund norm in international environmental law is, is extremely debatable, but maybe there needs to be one. And here I want to pay tribute to a number of bodies of scholarship. One a particular one is the scholarship of Klaus Bosselmann and uh, Kim Lak Hyun from uh, Korea, who've written a series of interesting um, uh, articles on this topic. Uh, there's a whole range of people uh, proposing different forms of what you might call Earth-centric or, or eco-centric approaches to law. There, is, there isn't just one option uh, on offer. Um, and also, if I may put it this way, uh, with great respect, our very own Dr. Petra Butler and her colleague, um, Catherine Yorns Magallanes have also been uh, norm entrepreneurs on this uh, particular uh, issue and in the development of international law. There's a really interesting special issue of the New Zealand Journal of Public and International Law on new thinking about sustainability from a few years ago. They brought together a whole range of different practitioners. And what's so good about that is that they weren't pushing anyone's particular idea they were basically opening up a forum for, for dialogue between people with, with very contrasting ideas, extremely open-minded and um, kaleidoscopic uh, initiative. So if I can just summarize in, uh, in a couple of minutes what the concept of ecological integrity and planetary boundaries would involve. Uh, Bosselman calls it the protection of the biophysical conditions that are essential for long-term sustainable development. They identify, based on the science, nine planetary boundaries, and three of them have already been crossed, meaning that we are facing the danger of you know, severe non-linear effects, potentially planetary collapse within the coming couple of generations. And those boundaries are climate change, biodiversity loss, interference with the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, stratospheric ozone depletion, ocean acidification, global freshwater use, changes in land use, chemical pollution, and atmospheric aerosol loading. There you go. But basically what they're saying is, if we don't get those nine right, in a sense, everything else is gonna fall off the table. All our other ambitions for social development, human development, economic growth, are not gonna be safely realized in a, in a world in which those nine things have not been got right.
And they draw two major conclusions from that in terms of the way we think about how international environmental law should work. The first is, and it may be obvious, but the first is, this is a corridor where we actually have to make sure we land within the safe zone. Which means you can no longer think about <coughs> trade-offs and you can't really think so much about balancing. You just have to make sure that you get into that zone and then you can start debating everything else. Secondly, like again, relatedly, this means that there would be a hierarchy of norms or a hierarchy object of objectives in this way of thinking about international law. First, you have to protect the biophysical base. And once you have secured that, then other norms come into play, like society and the economy and so on. Um, so, of course, there are many different authors who have different Earth-centric theories, and it's extremely interesting to investigate many much wisdom drawn from indigenous people's knowledge idea philosophical ideas about you know is the earth a living system and do, do trees have rights and all of that but what i would say to, would be the takeaway is uh, to say this planetary boundaries concept is a piece of serious science that can be discussed by all countries in multilateral bodies. It's, it's, it's not easy to marginalize the concept of planetary boundaries in the way that it is, for better or worse, easier to marginalize some other philosophical concepts like Pachamama and, and Mother Earth and so on. And that if we take the concept of planetary boundaries and we also take a positive vision of what the world could look like in a hundred years time, then we have an orienting principle for international environmental law. And that positive vision is of a disaster, a climate change disaster, which we have managed to prevent turning into a climate change apocalypse. A huge difference. We are, we and our children are going to live through a climate change disaster, but it doesn't have to be an apocalypse. And what would a world of disaster, the better option, look like? It is a world essentially urban, mainly coastal, large conurbations of us living near the coasts, um, very interconnected with each other, focusing on human development rather than the creation of GDP for its own sake, huge conurbations of people that can feed themselves through urban farming and the like without needing to use the interiors of the continents as enormous uh, farms that become essentially biological deserts of, of agribusiness, intelligent use of technology like blockchain, shrinking our ecological footprint, and stage by stage, rebuilding the biophysical basis for flourishing life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and some have commented that Simon is on the case before the apocalypse dawns <laughs> on us all. So we turn now to Andrew McClay, who is going to be talking to us about the calculation of damages arising from environmental degradation and climate change. Andrew is a partner in the forensic accounting team with Forensic Risk Alliance in London, and he specializes in acting as an accounting expert in international commercial and investment arbitration cases. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, and thank you so much to Petra and Stephen and the Wilm Hale team for inviting me here. I have to say that um, I have found preparing this talk, as many of us have, um, quite uh, interesting because I've it got into areas that I hadn't got into before. And I'm sorry to bring you back from interplanetary um, discussions to numbers, but somebody did say that money was what we were all about in some of this um, litigation arbitration. So I'm going to look at the... Um, uh, and talking to Petra, what, what she asked me to do was to spend half my talk talking about the general principles of damages and then to, um, to go on to some of the specifics of environmental degradation and climate change um, further, further on from that. So just to, um, I mean, I do have a little bit of background of small states. At least I thought it was a small state. I lived in the country of Burundi for three years, but unfortunately I've just Googled it and it has a population of 10.8 million. So I'm not sure it is a <laughs> small state anymore. Um, I have also had the privilege of acting for the government of Albania on several um, uh, investor state and uh, ICC cases. And apparently it's still a small state at a population of 8.7 million. And I would say, I'm, just by way of aside for one of the things that was talked about, I'm actually also very proud that we won a counterclaim for the government of Albania in one of our cases. And um, much though they didn't quite award my massive calculation, which was slightly tongue in cheek, um, we did, it, it was slightly based on my, the calculation I'd done. So I have, have experience of winning counterclaims for 
I think it's still a small state, Albania. So um, I've also acted in relation to um, Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And also another, another one we did was, because um, it was being talked about yesterday, this NGO area. I was involved in a case, um, an investor state case, where the claim, one of the claims brought by the investing company was in relation to the change of minimum wage in the relevant country. So that also brings back to some of the um, NGO subjects that we have been talking about. So anyway, getting on to the very practicalities now of um, this is how you do a damages calculation. And we're, we're getting back to things which may not be anything to do with climate change. So basically, this is the very basic outline of any economic damage claim, which is the same as often in breach of contract claims. What one is trying to do is to put the, um, put the claimants back into the position they would have been in had the relevant intervening event not um, occurred. So in the context of environmental degradation claims, the claimant may be claiming for restitution of the position existing before the damage, for example, cleaning up the river, cleaning up the lake before chemicals were, were poured into it and killed the fish, or and or they may be claiming for damages, loss of profits um, as part of the, the claim. So some of these losses are things which are very easy to, well, not very easy, but relatively easy to, to calculate while, uh, uh, and are common to us as forensic accountants because, I mean, in terms of cleaning up a lake, it would be it would be experts on pollution and, and so on who would estimate the cost of actually cleaning the lake itself. But we would be able to calculate the loss of profits arising to the local residents or the fishermen or whatever from not having been able to go out and catch the fish. Some of the things are very speculative, but generally one needs to one can generally calculate something as a as an as a quantum expert whether one gets to the level of reasonable certainty or whatever the relevant level is for the relevant arbitration you're in is a different matter. And I, and I do think that sometimes some of the claims can be a little bit speculative. So it's a question of what level of certainty is needed in getting to, um, to, to the, the loss before you can be awarded um, damages. So that's the basic calculation. Moving on a little bit to um, refine that in a loss of profit claim. This is the loss of profit claim principle. We calculate the loss of revenue suffered by the claimant. We multiply it by the um, gross profit percentage of the claimant, which is generally something you can, you can find quite easily. And then you calculate the loss of profit suffered by um, a, a corporate in, in common circumstances. And these, this is wider than climate change here. Then you deduct any, any additional costs which have been saved as a result of the um, intervening event and you add on um, additional costs incurred at the bottom. And so I'd say there in terms of, um, uh, and, and of that, that last bit is probably of, of high importance in the context of environmental damages claims, because um, in the context of climate change, that would um, involve adding on the cost of, say, sea defences, um, relocating Sorry, Simon. South Sea Islanders from one from one place to another, or whatever. So there are there are um, yeah, the, the 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 costs obviously can be very high in terms of um, climate change. And I love this graph. Sorry, this is one of my favourite graphs. I drew this graph. If you, for, for those who would like to know, it's the only picture in any GAR Global Arbitration publication ever. And I'm not quite sure why I was ever allowed to get it in, but it came um, from from Steve's um, comp Steve, Steve's firm. John Trenner allowed us to put in a, a picture, but it, I think it illustrates very pictorially what one is trying to do in a in a um, in any damages claim. Because what you've got here is you've got the the bottom line, which is what actually happened in practice, and then you've got the top line, what would have happened, and what would have happened in what we love as quantum people to talk about the but for scenario. So the top is the but for, the bottom is what actually happened, and the bit in the middle is your claim. And it's the same for anything, because it's the same if you've lost, had a breach of contract, it's the same if you've suffered um, environmental degradation, if you're the same if you've lost your fishing rights. If, the, the principle is the same. It's the difference between what would have happened and what actually happened. So I think it's a, a great picture. Just one other slide, and I'm going to go over this quite well, I think I'm not going to give them this great detail. The, there's the, also the calculation of quantum in the context of um, investment treaty work. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated, and it's subject to endless arguments in every um, every um, investor state case. But in general principles, 
damages is equal to the, um, the, the well, in very general principles, equal to the fair market value of the investment before whatever expropriation event occurred. And I'm, I'm here, I'm jumping back rather into what Steve was talking about in terms of investment, a classic investment treaty case where something's been expropriated. When you get into um, unlawful expropriation, for those who lawyers uh, amongst you, you get into the, the whole horseshoe factory standard of, um, of um, um, full, rep full reparation and uh, articles, uh, Article 36 of the draft ILC articles on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts. But so when we're getting into those sort of expropriation case, we're looking at the fair market value of the thing before, before the event happened or else um, a full reparation standard. So those are the basic general principles of any, any damages claim. Ha forget about um, environmental degradation up to this stage. And we'll now begin to look at um, environmental degradation and trying to apply this in that context. So these are just the thoughts. These are just thoughts. There's not an awful lot of, well, there are cases, this, there are cases out there for environmental degradation. When we get into climate change, there aren't many cases. So. Um, what we are looking at is the, the potential claims that can be made, brought in these cases. And so the potential claims may be the cost of remediation. Uh, it may be the loss of profits or the loss of livelihoods suffered by the people in one way or other. Or then it may be, particularly when we move over to the US, our, our dear old securities claims. So, you know, much though we are talking about environment and, in, uh, and um, climate change, the most powerful claim that you may be able to bring is actually a securities claim in the US about, um, or particularly in the US, it doesn't have to be the US, but the, as to whether the, the company has actually disclosed properly and fully over the whole period of time that it knew about the um, potential risk, whether it's disclosed that properly in its accounts and its 10Ks and all its other statements. And there are myriads of lovely class action lawyers in New York who'd be longing to bring a claim for small states, probably on that on 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 securities claims um, uh, issues. So then we've got um, issues here. I, I raised some of the issues, the problems. I mean, and this these move into climate change too. Causation and the standard of certainty needed. And we, in a way, as quantum experts, we we can calculate things, but we are reliant on the lawyers and the facts um, of the case. So the question really is, what is the standard of certainty needed? in order to get an award for damages. Then apportionment of damages to different causes. So, you know, say you've got chemicals poured into a river and the fish die and people get ill. What is the actual cause of that? Is it, is it the chemicals or would the people have died anyway? Or would the, um, you know, were there other causes that could have happened? Or could it have been a mixture of climate change and the chemicals poured into the river? You've got to, you've got to work out how you apportion the damages between the different causes what, I mean, one theory is that any one thing can cause all the damage. So, you know, if, if, if it was one thing, you should be liable for 100% of the damages. Or if it's a multitude of different things that have caused the problem, do you allocate that and say, you know, look, we're going to say 4% of the damage was caused by that chemical factory um, upstream or, or whatever. So these are questions. I don't need the answer to these things. Then valuing the loss of human life. Stigma claims. So, you know, if... if um, if uh, the, the, the lake has been cleaned up, but actually nobody ever wants to go and visit that lake again because um, it's got a reputation for being a sort of, you know, a horrible place. You've got, a, you've got the whole of that sort of intangible stigma claim that, that may be brought. Um, and then I also raised the question, can a company or a state be liable before the issue was actually known about? So I'll then give you one of my haste. I don't like this case. Um, that the traffic era case of the chemicals being tipped into the sea off um, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so 16 people, I mean, I just got this off the internet, so if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Um, but 16 people died and more than 100,000 people, well, I know the case, but the facts I got off the um, internet. Um, it was a long, long case, but at the end of the day, traffic era, without admitting any liability, did pay um, compensation of 198 million dollars to the government of Cote d'Ivoire for a compensation fund for the construction of a waste treatment plant and for recovery operations. Apparently, 
$50 million was awarded to individual claimants in a UK uh, class action. And there was a fine by the Dutch government um, against um, the company for the, the, the toxic waste. So these are kind of examples of, of claims that can be brought, because you can see some of those claims are actually rectification, re reparation claims. Some of them are uh, an attempt to quantify um, the damages caused to the individual people, because the idea was that $1,700 was paid to each of 30,000 claimants. So it's an attempt to get to a number. And that one doesn't involve loss of profits. So then moving on to the my final frontier, or my, the final, yeah, the final frontier. I'll probably have to deal with them in in, in 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 the next few years. Anyway, is climate is is damages from climate change itself, and here you really get into things that have never really got anywhere very far yet in terms of quantum, but but you can try and quantify these things, um, and, and and so here you've got potential claims, claims for economic damages, so claims for the money loss, the the, the loss of livelihood, the loss of um, loss of earnings for people that have suffered from one reason or the other, or you then may have claims for the resources to protect from the impact of climate change. So, you know, I, 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 I before the floods in Doncaster in the last few weeks, I was reading about um, the Thames in in Surrey and Berkshire. Apparently, this we're going to spend seven hundred million. I'm not quite sure why this is. This is probably because it's down south. We're going to spend seven hundred million pounds um, on flood defences for the Thames all the way along along the Thames at the moment. That's not, well, it's not, not a claim particularly, but it's just saying a lot of money going to be spent on something. And you can imagine a scenario that somebody could claim something against somebody else um, for those sorts of things. The second issue is the potential respondents. And I think you all know about this, but the potential respondents, and I'm not an expert on this, are either um, states, uh, big industrial states, not, not nice, lovely um, small states, but um, the, the big generators of climate change, which may be the oil super majors or, or others. Um, so, and I, I don't actually quite know, I'm not, because I'm not a lawyer, which one you would make the claim against, but um, you could possibly make the claim against one or the other or both. But then the issues here are big, big issues. Um, causation, you know, do we have sufficient, and I'm not a scientist, do we have sufficient evidence to prove the, the relevant linkages in a climate change um, linkage to prove who is actually guilt, who is actually liable for any particular um, natural disaster. I mean, do we really have the evidence to prove that, you know, BP was responsible for the floods in Doncaster last week? I mean, it, it's quite it's quite complicated. So, and it's far far beyond me. But I think that's that's one of the major major areas that that anybody who's going to bring a claim and lawyers who are thinking about bringing these in the future, I've got to, we've, we've got to try and work out um, that issue. And then the apportionment of damages, that's what I said before. How does one calculate damages? Well, I think we can calculate damages, um, but um, it's, it's, it's apportioning the liability, which may be extremely difficult. Should damages be restricted only to the cost of protection against climate change? Um, and now that the potential claims are absolutely enormous. I mean, when I was thinking about this case, I was looking, thinking about these things, I was going back to some of the other major cases in the past, such as um, asbestosis. You know, asbestosis wiped out that the one company in this country that was kind of responsible for most of the asbestos turn renewal was just wiped out. So you wiped out the company, so you couldn't actually pay any more, it couldn't pay any more damages because it didn't exist anymore. I think now in some of the big um, competition and even corruption, uh, old, uh, settlements. There's this concept of ability to pay. So the idea is not necessarily to wipe out the company because that doesn't actually help anybody, but to limit the um, liability to what the company can actually pay. And then the last one, finishing off with, um, again, I think there are, <laughs> I think we're all quoting the same examples here, but there, there are only about 10 cases out on the internet, I think, that I could that I could find and know about. And I think we've already talked a bit about the Torres Strait Islanders, so I shall leave the, them aside. The Kivalina one, I I mean, I read, I read about Mr. Louis, he was my alternative one, so he might have appeared on my slide too, Matthew. But um, the Kivalina one, I think, was interesting because here was an island um, where, where people had lost, um, lost fishing of whales, seals, and other animals as a result of the loss of sea ice. And somebody calculated the damages uh, as between 95 and 400 million. 
Um, but the claim was dismissed by the U.S. District Court and then further discussed on appeal. So nobody um, actually managed to get any money out of it. But they were kind of getting in the right general direction, I think, with um, Kivalina. So with that, I don't know the answer. I'd love to know what the answer is. Thank you very much, Andrew. Andrew's taken us now to the final frontier. Even though he tells us he doesn't actually know the answer, I think he knows more answers than he's letting on. So that brings us then to the question and answer portion of today's panel. And I'm going to start with a question for Steve as I forced him to rush through his panel at uh, his portion of the panel at 90 miles an hour. So one of the interesting areas that Steve very briefly touched on was the question of the use of mediation and conciliation to resolve these sorts of disputes. So Steve, do you think that mediation and conciliation are actually a serious option for small states? I, I do. And, and Maybe no one will hear me say why. <laughs> <laughs> Have we got? Can we get the microphone? Do you want to? Is it off? Or no, this, I don't know this which one. one. Oh, this one's on. You've got one there. Okay, so now it works. Uh, I, I think mediation is always an option. I think that anybody who's doing dispute resolution has to always think about all the options, and mediation and conciliation is clearly one. In, in, in a, a variety of treaties, ranging from investment treaties to some of the state-state uh, state treaties we were talking about, um, there is mediation as an option. Uh, sometimes it's a prerequis prerequisite to litigation or arbitration. Uh, when we talk about it in the context of climate change and environmental issues, I think one of the one of the questions that people have is why does the polluter want to come to the table? But there are times where um, doing something consensually through a process that is confidential to some degree, even if the outcome shouldn't be in this type of context, may get people to come to the table. And what you try and, and some of the advantages you could potentially have when you're using mediation is you may be using a, a a, a mechanism that allows you, if you have an ongoing relationship, to continue to to work in that ongoing relationship. It may allow you to de-escalate the issues by not having gone through a formal process that is one that is going to get worldwide attention. So you, attention is sometimes a good thing. It, it's leverage, but sometimes it's a bad thing. And so mediation may be a way um, to de-escalate a dispute. I think one of the most important things about mediation and, and why it's a, a, an option is that it allows the parties to talk about their interests, not just the legal remedies and rights that might be there between them. So it allows you to expand the discussion and be more creative in the solutions because you don't have to be limited to what might be achieved through whatever mechanism is available for you. And also, if you're talking about uh, a discussion with, for example, a, a company, and it, a company that might be set up in, through a corporate family where the emitting part of the company is somewhere far away from where you can reach them, in mediation, you can bring, because it's consensual, you can bring in affiliates and a broader group of entities into, into the discussion. So all those things, I think, are uh, potential real benefits to using mediation from a small state's perspective. That b Before you get to process, which is if it works, you might save a lot of time and a lot of costs. Um, and you so therefore may be able to also avoid some of the capacity and other restraints that we've been we've been talking about. Now there are challenges, and one of the issues with mediation is if you get to a successful result, what happens if the other side doesn't um, want to abide by it, and where do you go? Now one of the things that we haven't I don't think anyone's mentioned in the, in the last two days is we now have the Singapore Mediation Convention, which would be a way that would create. Uh, enforceability of a, a, a mediated resolution um, in a way that's similar to arbitration awards. And we've, uh, someone said, maybe it was somebody from Singapore, <laughs> said uh, yesterday, in, at least in talking, that it's the, the, the treaty that, that's had the most countries sign up to it the quickest so far, right? So, so, um, uh, so th this is why mediation, I think, is increasingly something that has to be has to be thought about. Um, and there are there are limits. There's, you have to be smart about how you, how you use it. You obviously can waste time in mediation, and you can waste costs if you're not prepared to do it right. And I think one of the challenges is that governments need to think about how they are joined up internally to mediate properly, because you'll have often different constituencies within a government when you're talking about these sorts of disputes, and you can't mediate and make a decision to settle something within a government unless you really have everybody on board with, and you might have to negotiate within the government and the government interests to make sure everyone has their interests aligned. But I do think mediation is something that has to be um, used more and, and, and taken seriously. Thank you very much. 
Um, we, we heard in the last panel that everything ultimately comes down to money, really, and whether or not states can afford to do things. Now, if a state wants to use a dispute resolution mechanism other than its own courts to pursue a private investor for claims relating to environmental damage, doesn't this mean it's going to incur significant costs? Are there ways in which it can avoid incurring those sorts of costs? Well, I just gave us one. <laughs> one potential way, but but the um, I, I, and this is the previous panel. I think was a little bit too pessimistic to uh, on some of these issues. Um, I thought I heard it said that there isn't much cost shifting in um, international arbitration, at least, and I think that's simply wrong. And I think now the norm is cost shifting, including in in treaty cases, and therefore uh, that that doesn't solve the upfront problem of paying for the case. But if you are on good, if you have a good basis for your, your case as a government, you may at least be looking at the possibility of having your costs recovered at the end of the case. So I think we need to think about, about that. I also, if we talk about, as, as we started to talk about a little bit, the idea of states bringing claims either as counterclaims or through other vehicles, um, and then some of the restraints that the previous panel talked about in terms of why would funders want to be involved where there's no upside for them. Well, suddenly there is upside. If a, if a, if a state is is bringing uh, a claim where there might be something that is something that could be shared with a funder. So I think that starts to create additional opportunities. And so I think there are, there are um, ways, particularly if we start to create mechanisms where states can, can bring in, uh, particularly in an arbitration context, uh, claims directly where you would also see a basis to start thinking about ways to fund this, in addition to the ones that were talked about in, in the last panel. Thank you very much. Um, before we open the, the questions to the floor, I'm, I'm just going to ask um, Matthias a question as well, as again, he was the victim of a slightly accelerated presentation. We've heard a lot today about the potential of blockchain and how it can be beneficial dealing with climate change disputes. Is this all, though, not some sort of techno-dystopian Silicon Valley dream? That's a, that's a, <coughs> hello. <coughs> yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, I mean, technology is always neutral in the way that it's being applied, right? It, it depends on the consciousness that is actually applying the technology. So, so you could say the same thing about nuclear power, you could say the same thing about many other things. So in, in its essence, the technology is neutral. And, and my intention with this talk today was to raise a little bit of awareness on the better side of the spectrum, how you could actually use the, con uh, the technology to, to raise awareness and maybe utilize it uh, to speed up processes like the one I've, I've, I've portrayed. And uh, the example with the river that uh, uh, he, Andrew, um, talked about that could be an example where you implement a multidisciplinary team, actually, where a blockchain, just it's just a base layer technology. It's not, it's not the solve of it all. That would require a legal team, like, like the people present here. It would require scientists that actually define the criteria, develop the, the, the proper, appropriate sensors that measure, actually, what, what metrics you're going for, and then you need technologists that that um, you know, implement the technology, and, and only that coming together of different groups of professions and, and, and competencies, uh, I think, can solve these challenges that we are facing on a, on a global basis. And, um, and, and that's, in essence, also what I meant with the red pill moment, um, because a technology like that spurs and sparks collaboration. It's, it's in essence, a very deeply globally collect, connected technology. And, and the way it's being run, it's literally, and, and I couldn't make that point properly before, it's on a global basis and we're drawing heavily from open innovation. We have a community of 10,000 people. We're drawing not only capital from, uh, to your point, uh, Mr. Diplomat, from before, um, and, and they are very you know, idealistic and, and value driven. And, it, and the question before came up in, in terms of just a short remark in terms of the funding discussion, you know, who would actually fund uh, uh, small state actions, uh, lawsuits, or, or litigation campaigns. I mean, what I've experienced being in that industry for a very long time, there is a, a large amount of people out there that is very idealistic and value driven. And once you are able to tap into those networks of people that are 
are driven by those values, then you might be surprised how much money is actually available even without an investor return on certain issues because there might be more people that are interested in swimming in a clean ocean or breathing clean air than, than the average person might suspect. So that's as a, as a bigger umbrella to, to some of the issues mentioned before. Thank you. Nell, does anyone on the floor have any questions? Yes, Nora, have we got a microphone? Thank you very much. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, thanks to the panelists. It's a very interesting discussion. And um, the question of taking action by way of counterclaim for environmental damage as, as a state is interesting. I, my, I've done some work from a cultural heritage perspective, and I use the environmental uh, claims as a as a part as a I drew upon that, those sources for for that that exploration because there are treaties that protect cultural heritage like the World Heritage Convention um, doesn't adequately allow action to be taken. My question to, I guess, Steve and possibly Simon is that how do you, how do you keep, take such an action in relation to a counterclaim when the action has to relate to the investment where the current treaties provide uh, protections and obligations and rights in relation to specific, you know, that, that investment. The recent treaty, the one that I'm thinking of, Nigeria and Morocco, I think, has imported uh, environmental mm. obligations. Um, but which, how do you do it in the sense of do you do you um, do, do we have to update current treaties, which obviously is a big task? Is it new treaties or which? How would you import that obligation and into which specific clause in the treaty that you're moving to be able to for a state to take that action? So lots, lots of questions, and I think the answer in part is today it's difficult because it is very dependent on whatever intent was expressed through the language in the treaty. And while we're seeing tribunals more open to the idea of finding um, a no bar on a counterclaim and then maybe reading what the scope of the counterclaim is relatively broadly, it still is constrained by the language of the treaty. And that may not let you go beyond the investment and it may require some sort of relationship to the investment, which probably makes sense, frankly, if we're going to do it through a, uh, an investment treaty in any event. But what we are seeing, and so I think ultimately to get where you, you want to be, I think, and where other people in the room want to be, is we are talking about new mechanisms. Um, and we're seeing, I know, and I don't know where it's gotten to, but the, a, the African Union is um, talking about a, a, a approach that will be regional that will try to take into account those sorts of considerations. And, and I don't know where the draft is at this point, but that's very much on their agenda, is to try to animate these sorts of obligations um, in a two-way in a two-way mechanism within within treaties. So I think I think ultimately to make this work, and I think this is why the discussion this morning was 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 so good, was that we need to think about new mechanisms. We need to identify where the problems exist and figure out how do you overcome that. And I'm not sure where what what provision of the treaty you might want to put this in. I mean, but the point you're raising is that sort of broad language we see in like the Dutch the the, the Dutch model bit that I showed isn't really an effective way to introduce those sorts of obligations. You need to be much clearer about their scope and their limitations and how they work. And so that needs to be done. Um, and so one way is to is new approaches to the, the, the type of investment treaties we have now. Another approach is to think about new ways to create treaties that are designed to be you know, with a different mentality than a one-way protection of investors. Thanks, Noor, for the question. Yes, well, I'm, I, I'm with Stephen in being skeptical about the existing system. As we know, there, there are very few examples of counterclaims. And the leading one, the Burlington case, was one which doesn't, isn't really a working example because it was a dependent on an ad hoc consent by the um, investor rather than truly mandatorily falling within the treaty. Um, and of course, the, the big problem, as I see it with counterclaims, is the consent of the investor is not there until they start the arbitration. The state has made an open offer, the investor has not. Now, that's why... We, I'm throwing things didn't in. know my answer was that bad. <laughs> um, the, but that, that's why I, I also think, that in terms of the new mechanisms and the proposal which um, Justice Ambeng Kandakasi raised this morning, is a really exciting idea. And I was just wondering whether, in fact, 
uh, investor state arbitration has given us the the first clue to solving the problem with the concept of an open offer. I mean, what if a state says, okay, you can invest in my country, but at the stage of admission of the investment, there's one condition, which is that you sign this letter. And this letter says, this is an irrevocable open offer to arbitrate any dispute relating to, and you then obviously define the content, this, it could be breaches of national law, failure to follow generally accepted international standards, breaches of international obligations insofar as they apply to corporations, and so on. And then you have got the consent to arbitration. Now, if one small state tried to do that on its own, the result would, of course, be investors flee elsewhere. Uh, if 50 small states decide to do it all at the same time, I suspect the result could be could be different. And, and that's why I think what the AU is doing is worth watching. But also, there was a book a year or two ago by several authors. Uh, Jose Amado, I think, was a lead off author called, uh, I think, uh, Arbitrating the Conduct of Investors. And the proposal in the book is to have a two-way treaty. And one of the questions you immediately ask is, why would an investor ever want to subject itself to arbitration? And the immediate answer is, if you are exposed to the courts of the of the country where the where the the investment's been made, you very well may prefer to be in an international arbitration proceeding that will allow you to participate in a more neutral forum than the state courts of the place where you're you've been accused of of wrongdoing. Um, uh, and so, therefore, there it isn't. While I think most people's immediate reactions is there's no. You're not, you'll never get that consent unless you force it, and then the, and then that's one of the issues I I want to think through about the New York Convention and and some of these mechanisms. But um, there is, on a second look, some appeal to investors that if the option is if they really have infrastructure and assets in a country and there's issues that relate to their investment and and whether they've complied with regulation, do they really want to be in local courts? Or may they want to be? Maybe they want those issues to be decided in a outside of the country in a neutral process where they're involved in picking the arbitrators and all the things that come along with international arbitration. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, I, I've got, I suppose, Professor Nicole, the newer question, uh, and that is that uh, while climate change clearly is going to affect uh, amounts of rainfall, wind, storms, and terrestrial, but essentially humans are terrestrial, they're not dolphins. And what climate change is bringing, and how would you bring, is loss of land, but it's coastal or small islands. So, and it will happen, it happens in stages, where first of all it becomes uninhabitable because of the sort of water lens and so on, and sometimes it's not there. And when it's not there, then things start to change like baseline for growth of the sea and fishing rights. Uh, how do we tackle long term the loss of land to sea? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a pretty big question. Are we are we up for a challenge, gentlemen? Simon, do you want to take a stab at it? Um, yeah, I will. Can, do you want to take another one? Or yes, Simon is going to he's going to contemplate how to solve global warming generally and um, loss of land. So perhaps somebody else would like to ask a question while he thinks. Perhaps I'll ask a question. Um, and I'm going to ask um, this question of Andrew, who hasn't yet had the opportunity to have a question. So, Andrew, do you envisage a time when damages awards for environmental damage and climate change will be regarded as standard? Am I answering, am I answering before Simon? Or is you, Simon, you are, still Simon is brainstorming, and you can, you can see the smoke coming out of his ears. <laughs> so this is your moment in the sun. Let's just let Simon concentrate. He's got a big, a big problem to solve here. I think um, I think claims for environmental degradation are, uh, are not um, not impossible at all. They're, 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 one, one can I mean it depends what it is, but you can you can quantify claims for environmental degradation, and if you can work out who's caused it, and, and let's talk about let's just think about sort of you know just over a, a couple of years period of time. I mean if we get if we going back to something that was caused maybe 20 years earlier then you have got ba major issues of causation but i mean if you've got something you know if you've got a chemical plant or if you dare say dare i say you've got a um a dam in um 
Latin America that's that's birth, burst, you can you can actually work out who is liable. And I was discussing this last night. As as a, as a quantum accountant, you can generally calculate some way of a reasonably accurate. Well, whether it's accurate or not, uh, you can accurate, you can calculate a number for the loss that's been suffered by some people. How you put a value on the loss of human life, that's obviously very difficult, but you can generally get to some numbers for um, something where something's just happened in the last you know, year or two. When you get into things that are caused, when you get into climate change, for me, not being a scientist, you've got this major, major issue of proving it, evidence. Um, how you prove that the loss of an island in the South Pacific. Who who caused that? Was it China? Was it America? Or was it the UK? Or, you know, who who caused it? Was it Shell? Was it BP? Was it Texaco? You know, who caused that loss? So I think there are major, major difficulties there in le uh, levels of fairness. There may be new UN conventions to say that you know it's the that the responsibility should be placed upon hydrocarbon companies or something, but at the moment, I don't know that, I just don't know how to allocate the loss of value from climate change to anybody. And, and maybe Stephen can correct me this. I don't even know whether whether it's fair to allocate that loss to governments rather than companies or who it's done. I mean, I think reading one of those articles I was talking about on the internet talked about 47 um, major causes of um climate change or something, either the big, and that was a mixture, actually, the 47 was a mixture of the big uh, hydrocarbon companies and the big states. Uh, and I, I don't know how you allocate the loss between, say, even those 47, although some, since somebody's got it down to 47, maybe it's not as difficult as, um, as I thought. Well, one of the issues, one of the issues ends up being, if you can, it is a question of evidence and causation. And so maybe the answer is, you can't allocate full responsibility, but you can say if you've got a basis as Papua New Guinea to bring a claim against company X, and you can show their market share in one of the 47 causes of climate change, you can, you give that to you, you could calculate yeah. the value of that company's piece of the whole, the whole uh, set of causal events, potentially. I mean, it's hard, but it's not impossible. Well, but, but actually, maybe, that's also, I, can, maybe yeah. I can add a little here. In the RWE case, uh, what they had as a basis is a is a is a, rep a scientist report from 2013, and that report calculated that RWE is responsible for 0.5 percent of the emissions that that cause the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect is causing causation is pretty well established. That's tied to the CO2 levels in the atmosphere that cause the warming. And there are soil samples, ice core samples, uh, 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 dendrochronology logical samples that reach back thousands and hundreds of thousands of years and we are at a level of co2 that hasn't been on the planet in the last 30 million years and there's a very clear causation that's being established and that has been um calculated so our rwe the emissions they put into the atmosphere can be calculated and that was the basis for for that lawsuit and thank you do we did we have another question on the second row, yes? Let's get you out. Got the microphone? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a small one. Um, just getting a little bit concerned um, that all, you are all talking about um, mm. money terms. If you are an indigenous person out there, the calculation of forests, calculation of the ocean, calculation of everything around you that gets damaged, I don't think you can put many things on your hands. No. It's, 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 a, it's a wonder. <laughs> it's a. It's a wonderful point that we all need to keep in mind that it's not all about money, but money sometimes is an engine that makes things happen. Um, in some of the cases that have been alluded to by several people where there has been legal personage given to a river, for example, the remedy isn't money there, but the remedy is protections and, 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 and an obligation to protect the river. So that's so there are sometimes non 
monetary remedies that are more in keeping with the, with the approach that I think you're suggesting. It's also why I want what I was trying to say, not as well as you just did, about why mediation can be something to be considered because you can go beyond. Legal rights often are only protected through awards of, of compensation where the interest might be much broader than that. And in, in, in a mediated or conciliated solution, you might be able to identify the interests that are not so easily reducible to, to money, but come up with ways to solve problems that um, consider a broader context. And actually, just to, to add, I mean, I, I was talking about money because that's what I tend to calculate in arbitrations. But I think the first, the first, you know, half of my money was about the cost of um, of putting something back to the position it would have been in, or cost of stopping something happening. So I think the half, the half of the damages awards, maybe, maybe simply saying to a company or a, a polluter or something, look, you have got to put this back into the position it would, it was in before. Um, Okay, you can't regrow the Amazon jungle that fast, but you can put things back into a position that you can protect. Um, you, you can, the, the, the things you can do, which is which are to do with protection of the environment, and that does involve costs, but it it it's it can protect against something happening in the future. So that's one aspect of it. As long as it's a very short comment, yeah. sir, because um, I, Simon has to <laughs> That's Simon, the answer. Simon is finally ready to, to tell us the universal answer to um, water levels rising. And, uh, okay, I will not hold him back. Just to add a, a practical case to uh, Stephen's point on mediation and the, and the beauty of mediation. Arbitration will concentrate on finding who's at fault. And then we don't talk about mm -hmm. the aftermath of what has happened and the aftermath of uh, where you are at the decision point. So where, what mediation does is uh, look at future, uh, how people will be. And there was a case I did in uh, PNG. A uh, major oil palm production company was alleged to uh, cause environmental damage done to the marine uh, resource of the local people. They filed proceedings came before me and I ordered that to, well, there was going to be some argument around the science, so I ordered James Cook Kinney to do a, a report, a scientific report on whether there was damage or no damage. So with that, that argument was removed, and when we went to mediation, the company just simply accepted, owner was in Europe, the general manager was in Papua New Guinea, the point of view was um, maybe, and they eventually they agreed on outcome, not only in money terms, there was money involved, that was to be paid in the form of compensation, but then they had to do something about the plant that causes the oil pump and this chart that eventually went down to the marine resort there could not have been arrived at had I just sat in court and did my report then. Okay. Excellent points. Right, Simon, the floor so, is yours. Uh, thank you. So, uh, I thought that was a wonderful question, if I may say so, from from uh, I think Mr. Ian Orr in the, in the audience, the NOAA question. I just want to offer three thoughts uh, in response to that. Um, so if you recall, the question was, what do we do about rising sea levels and, and, and the threats to land and so on? First point, uh, well, uh, under, I think it's Article 21, if I'm not wrong, of the Law of the Sea Convention, an island is a naturally formed geological feature that is above the sea at high tide. It has to be naturally formed in the first place, but you, you are allowed to artificially defend them. So that doesn't stop it being an island and therefore qualifying for all the maritime territory under international law. So for example, the Federated States of Micronesia or Tuvalu or whatever can fortify any, uh, what is currently an island with walls around it to ensure that at high tide it remains dry. And if they do so, then no matter how, whether the sea rises outside of those walls, what is within those walls will still be an island and under international law will be entitled to the maritime territory rights that islands have today. And of course, you don't need to enclose more than a minimal space within the walls in order to keep it an island and keep the same amount of maritime territory. Uh, second point, the International Law Association has just completed a very detailed study uh, by the leading experts in this field about how international law should treat the baselines for maritime territory in a climate change situation, um, led by, I think, Professor David uh, Freestone in uh, George Washington University. And their conclusion was that to recommend that states 
parties to the Law of the Sea Convention uh, treat existing maritime territories as fixed. That is to say, the, the exclusive economic zone of, a, of an island state is what it is today. And if uh, islands within that disappear, or if the coast of a state retreats, and therefore it, it, its baselines for calculating maritime territories move inland, nonetheless, the existing outer boundaries of the maritime territory should remain what they are. Um, that's their recommendation. I can assure you there will be a battle about that because certain distant water fishing nations like Japan and Korea are absolutely delighted at the prospect of more high seas fishing becoming available in the Pacific. And therefore, <laughs> we have to look at supporting Pacific island states who are attempting to drive a process of the formation of customary international law, and in particular, regional customary international law, which is an exotic beast that maybe Manuel is more familiar with than, than most, given that so far the only example has been found in Latin America. Um, so, but, but nonetheless, there is a push to, uh, to get countries outside of the Pacific region to recognize a Pacific regional custom that rising seas will not affect rights to maritime territory because those states bear no responsibility for climate change. Final very quick thought. We just need to make better use of our, of our coasts in the long term, those of us who don't live on small islands in the sea. At the moment, of course, like coast, the use of coastlines and, and water boundaries is quite questionable. Uh, its sustainability is questionable. It's often very valuable real estate. But in the long term, the best use of that land may not be for housing. It may well be. It's going to become some sort of salt marsh. And the best thing you can do on that salt marsh is, you know, have an oyster farm or something rather than try and use it as a suburb. In which case, the kind of intelligent use of our coastlines when when they're under sustained uh, sea assault, that will involve regulating people's property. It will involve things which some people will say will be an expropriation, whether you actually expropriate it or you just regulate it to the point that they can't really use it as they want to. Uh, so there will again be major disputes about that and major scope, hopefully, for disputes lawyers to solve them constructively. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, on that very optimistic note, for all the disputes lawyers in the room, um, it just remains for me to thank Petra very much for the kind invitation, to thank all of our panelists, and to thank all of you for your excellent questions and for listening so attentively. So will you please join me in thanking the panel in the usual way. Thank you.